An update on the situation in Brussels, President Battles elected to the American Council on Education, and President Obama's trip to Cuba. These stories and more are up next. New Scene 4 starts right now. Good evening. Today is Wednesday, March 23rd. I'm Callie Fiegel. And I'm Caitlin Maluli. And here are your top stories. A retired state trooper killed a turnpike toll collector and security guard at a toll plaza and then was shot dead on Sunday morning, according to authorities. Clarence Briggs confronted toll collectors with a handgun, ordered them into an office, attempted to tie them up, and then fled after a struggle. Briggs then shot Danny Krause and Ronald Heist, a retired York police officer who was working as a turnpike security guard. Briggs then fired shots at, fare collection, at a fare collection vehicle, and when the driver fled, drove it to his car at the end of a service ramp and began unloading money into his car. State troopers arrived quickly, and shots were exchanged with Briggs, who was wounded and died at the scene, according to police. After five months of searching, authorities found a suspect wanted in connection with the November 13th Paris terror attacks hiding in Belgium. According to Belgium's foreign prime minister, the terror suspect, Salah Abedislam, was planning more attacks on Europe's European soil. Abedislam's attorney, Sven Mary, said that over the weekend, Belgian authorities questioned the suspect, who was wounded in the raid in which he was captured, and said that he was cooperating. Abedslam reportedly admitted that he intended to carry out suicide bombings in Paris in November, but pulled out at the last minute. However, a French prosecutor warned reporters to take anything with that Abedislam says, quote, with caution, end quote. Officials in Belgium and France heralded Abedislam's live capture as a rare opportunity to learn more about functioning terrorist networks in Europe, especially those with links to the Islamic State, which claimed responsibility for the Paris attacks. Two SUNY Geneseo students were elected village trustees for the first time in Geneseo history last week. Freshman Mary Rutigliano and junior Matthew Cook decided to run for village trustee after being approached about the positions. Geneseo Mayor Richard Hathaway said of the student trustees, quote, if the trustees are willing to share the burden of the responsibilities, then we look forward to working with them, end quote. Rutigliano and Cook already have several things on their agenda, one of them being the walkability of the village for young people and older citizens alike. Well, you might think computers and phones are the only devices that can get hacked. You're wrong. Federal authorities are issuing a warning to drivers, stating your car could be the next device hackers are looking into cracking into. According to a Wired report, FBI officials are warning people that the more digital cars become, the easier it is for them to be hacked. Months ago, security researchers proved cars can be hacked when they shut down a Jeep Cherokee while it was driving. However, besides this test, there have been no reported incidents of car hacking. SUNY Geneseo President Denise A. Battles has been elected to the Council of Fellows Board of the American Council on Education. She will serve on the council this year as well as begin her term as secretary, which is an elected officer position on the board's executive committee. The ACE Fellows program is the country's top higher education leadership development experience. Battles has held leadership positions on the Council of Fellows in the past, in addition to the two that she currently holds. For the first time in more than half a century, America and her president made a step to end the estrangement of Cuba. President Obama touched down in Cuba on Sunday, representing a diplomatic change that would have been impossible to imagine nearly five years before. While the president is hopeful open relations will encourage Cuba on a path to finally opening its economy after decades of isolation, changes are slow and human rights still blatantly ignored in many parts of the island. My view is that the begin at the beginning, not the end, is, this is the beginning, not the end of what a journey that is going to take some time, Obama told CNN in an interview at the beginning of the trip. The American president setting on the island is a novelty for most Cubans, as they have not seen a leader since Calvin Coolidge. Since Obama's announcement to end the separation of Cuba and the United States, the U.S. government has steadily removed restrictions on travel and commerce between the neighboring countries. Last week, officials announced some of the biggest changes, including allowing Cubans to open U.S. bank accounts and permitting Americans to travel here individually rather than as a group for educational or cultural reasons. So, what will the weather be like this week? Alexandra with the answer when we come back. I'm Alexandra Alamaris with your weather. This week is going to be a rainy one, so you're going to want to wear your rain boots and bring an umbrella. It's going to be partly sunny, but mostly rainy. Um, Morgan McFadden is up next with your world news. Stay right here on GSTV.
Good evening. I'm Morgan McFadden with your World News. More than 30 people are dead and more than 200 wounded after explosions struck Brussels during the Tuesday morning rush hour. Belgian officials say two blasts hit the international airport, another hit a metro station. Belgium issued a level 4 alert denoting serious and imminent attack at a news conference. Prime Minister Charles Michel said Belgium will defend its liberty and values. And he stressed the importance of returning to normal life in Brussels as fast as possible. Authorities say they are actively seeking a man in an image taken by the surveillance camera at the airport. Another image shows a man alongside two others, all three pushing luggage, luggage carts. The other two men may have acted as suicide bombers. Media outlets noted each of them wearing one glove, which indicates they may have been hiding a bomb trigger. As of 4 p.m. Tuesday, the Belgian Crisis Center reported that at least 10 people had died and 100 were wounded in the attack at the Zaventem airport, and that 20 people died at the Malbec metro station, where about 130 were wounded. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attacks in a statement released via the Amak News Agency, a group that's been linked to the, mil the militant extremists. The statement blames Belgium for, the, for participating in the fight against ISIS and says that several fighters detonated explosive belts at the airport and train station. French President Francois Hollande said terrorists struck Brussels, but it was Europe that was targeted and all the world that is concerned. Next up, Lily Goldman with your health news. <laughs> The Navy is backing research into an app that screens for autism with the hopes that it could be later used to look for signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. The Autism and Beyond app uses a smartphone camera and an algorithm to read children's facial expressions and then assesses their emotional response. William Wagner, a PTSD expert and psychologist at Providence VA Medical Center, sees a lot of potential for an app to be used to help screen for PTSD if it can prove reliable for a large population over time. PTSD often goes undiagnosed, and patients may not recognize the link between their symptoms and a traumatic event they have experienced. Patients also may not be willing to talk about the event, while, while sometimes symptoms are observed by other issues. This all coming from research published by the American Academy of Family Physicians. Duke University is currently studying whether it is feasible for caregivers to screen kids for autism using a mobile phone at home. The app can be downloaded for free, and they're also investigating whether it could also possibly reveal signs of mild traumatic brain injury and depression. A new blood test may potentially help detect Alzheimer's disease at an early stage, giving people up to 15 years warning before the symptoms appear. Scientists say the test is based on an immunochemical analysis using an infrared sensor. The sensor surface is coated with highly specific antibodies which extract biomarkers for Alzheimer's for the blood or the cerebrospinal fluid, taken from the lower part of the back, also known as lumbar liquor. Researchers um, said for the novel test, the secondary structure of the so-called amyloid beta peptides serve as biomarker. This structure changes in Alzheimer's patients. Researchers said in, this, in the misfolded pathological structure, more and more amyloid beta peptides can accumulate, gradually forming visible plaque deposits in the brain that are typical for Alzheimer's disease. This happens more than 15 years before first clinical symptoms appear, they said. Together with researchers from German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, Gewert and colleagues developed an infrared sensor for detecting misfolding of amyloid beta peptides. The infrared sensor extracts the amyloid beta peptide from the body fluids. After initially working with the cerebrospinal fluid, the researchers subsequently expanded the method towards blood analysis. We do not, quote, we do not merely select one single possible folding arrangement of the peptide. Rather, we detect how all existing amyloid beta secondary structures are distributed in their healthy and their pathological forms, said Gerwert. Researchers um, analyzed samples from 141 patients and they achieved a diagnostic precision of 84% in the blood and 90% in cerebrospinal fluid. Compared with the clinical gold standard, the test showed an increase of misfolded biomarkers as spectral shift of amyloid beta band below threshold, thus diagnosing Alzheimer's, researchers said. 
Katie Trabert is up next with your entertainment. Hi, I'm Katie Trabert with your entertainment news. It was a big night for SUNY Geneseo's hockey as the team rallied to another win in the NCAA tournament to make it the Division III semifinals. It's been a difficult year for the Ice Knights after they lost a teammate in January. All season the hockey team has played to honor Hutchinson, and Saturday night was no different as they took the ice at home for the NCAA quarterfinal game. Since Geneseo won Saturday night's game, they're advancing to this weekend's national semifinals in Lake Placid, New York, this Friday, and will play against the Wisconsin Stephen Point. The jury in Hulk Hogan's invasion of privacy suit against Gawker Media awarded the ex-wrestler $115 million. Hogan had sued Gawker, founder Nick Denton, and former editor A.J. Delorio for posting the nearly two-minute segment of Hogan's sex tape in 2012. Hogan's suit claimed Gawker had violated his privacy and sought $100 million. The wrestler won the suit on Friday. Lifelong Bruce Springsteen fan Scott Glowski passed down his love for the boss to his nine-year-old son, Zabi. As a result, they couldn't wait to see Springsteen in concert at the LA Sports Arena on Tuesday night. Scott knew it was a school night and that Zabi would be out past his bedtime, so they went prepared with a giant sign that read, quote, Bruce, I will be late for school tomorrow. Will you sign my note? End quote. After three and a half hours of rocking on the stage, Springsteen saw Zabi sign and later asked security to bring Scott and Zabi backstage for a private meeting. After asking for his teacher's name, Springsteen pulled out a pen and paper. The note read, quote, Miss Jackson, Zabi has been out late rocking and rolling. Please excuse him if he's tardy, end quote. When asked if Miss Jackson accepted the note, Zabi replied, yeah, totally. Well, that wraps up today's edition of News Scene. Be sure to tune in Monday for our next broadcast. Remember, GSTV can film your clubs and events. I'm Callie Teagle. And I'm Caitlin Maluli. Thanks for watching, and have a good night, Geneseo.